بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویورز آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ ایس ایم حالی ود دی پروگرام ڈیفینس اینڈ ڈپلومیسی سیاچین از دی ہائیسٹ تھیٹر آف وار ان دی ورلڈ بٹ انفارچونیٹلی آفٹر ٹوینٹی ایٹ ایئرز آف انلیگل آکیوپیشن بائی دا انڈین فورسز اٹ ہیڈ نیئرلی بیکم فارگاٹن بٹ آن سیونتھ آف اپریل دس ایئر اینڈ ایولانشی کلیمڈ ون ہنڈریڈ اینڈ تھرٹی فائیو وکٹمس we are still not sure about the fate of these people but the important thing is that the focus has returned on this particular tragedy let me not steal the thunder from two very able panelists we have in the studio today to discuss this issue we have with us air marshal shahid latif former vice chief of air staff and now a renowned defense analyst welcome we have with us ambassador shafkat kakakhel who among other capitals has also served in new delhi and we hope to benefit from his insight into this issue let me start with you air marshal what is the genesis of this problem that 28 years ago 13th of april 1984 the indians occupied this territory okay uh, to trace out the genesis uh, you will have to go back to 1948 Uh, which was the time when uh, Pakistan and India had a conflict in Kashmir. And post this 1948 conflict, uh, there was a ceasefire line uh, that was drawn in that area. And this ceasefire line uh, was then agreed upon uh, in a famous agreement which was signed by both parties at Karachi. The Karachi agreement. The Karachi agreement. The ceasefire line uh, was such that it took you to a map reference point which is also quite famous which is NJ9842 and up to that point it explained even with uh, the reference of ground locations as to how this line uh, was drawn. Uh, somehow there was one, uh, one liner after that uh, which said that from this point, this reference point onwards, it will be northwards up to the glaciers. northeast it said northwards uh, i will tell you how mm. it turned out to be the northeast uh, when this was further discussed in the agreement then this whole northwards disappeared you know this this understanding that it will be northwards which was very vague when they discussed they came to point to point uh, they discussed the entire line and then there was no reference of northwards. I think the assumption at that time was that this whole area is so inhospitable to human life that one never thought that there will be a dispute uh, between the two countries and it was left at that point. Uh, so like I said that northwards from this point in the agreement apparently it did not uh, cause any, any concern and it wasn't there uh, to begin with. In the initial part, when it was the uh, when it was the ceasefire line, it was there. But when we talked about this line being LOC, and then we discussed various points, then the uh, then the continuation towards north did not uh, come out as any significant uh, point at all. No, but why has Pakistan been claiming no, control I'll of come this? To that. That I'll come to that. So I'll come to that. This is just the beginning. Starting from that time, the first time. Uh, Uh, it was highlighted. We had our, uh, we had uh, the first UN representative uh, in Pakistan in uh, 1950, uh, who raised a report and put it up to the Security Council. And this was Sir Winston, and he raised this report and mentioned clearly, and said that uh, because of the uh, line that had been agreed upon, uh, and the natural contours, the placement of the glacier. and accessibility uh, to Karakoram uh, ranges, uh, he placed Siachin's control with Pakistan and mentioned it clearly. So that was the first uh, document that was prepared. Then uh, from the Indian side, uh, this was followed up uh, by another very famous writer, Lakhan Pal, who in 1958 uh, wrote a book titled uh, Documents and Notes. Uh, from uh, Kashmir dispute and in that he included Sir Winston's support and he supported it 
that was the second reference, important reference. The third reference uh, came out when uh, another Indian writer, uh, defense writer, uh, Ravi Rakhai, in his famous book, the 1982, round. the fourth round, the fourth round, the fourth round, uh, war between India and Pakistan, 1984, he also made a mention of this, and he clearly uh, placed the uh, glacier under Pakistan's control, giving the same reasons. In between, in 1962. Uh, the Indian Prime Minister Nehru uh, stood on the floor and he... Actually, if you permit, yeah. this was in, after the Indo-China War of 1962. Yes. In 1963, when Pakistan signed the Pak-China Agreement, yes. then uh, yes, Prime the, Minister Nehru, you please yes, go on. the Pak-China Agreement was signed uh, uh, and in that, the Chinese agreed and showed this demarcation of the glacier within Pakistan territory. But the incident you're talking about is that in the Lok Sabha, yes. he, he was asked, the prime, yes. Indian Prime Minister was asked, was asked, why has this been achieved? Yes. So what was his response? His response was that this is very much natural. And uh, he was convinced, uh, like I said, that uh, because of the accessibility uh, to the Karakoram and onwards to the glacier, the routes uh, that emanated, uh, you know, started from Pakistan, uh, he was convinced that uh, uh, Pakistan should exercise control on this area. And uh, a person no less than the Prime Minister of India in 1962 is on record as having said that the glacier uh, is part of the northern areas of Pakistan. So I have quoted to you at least four uh, different references. If you permit, let yes. me solicit the opinion of okay. uh, His Excellency the Ambassador. Sir, he mentioned Nehru, but uh, there have been other instances, international references, because the permission for international expeditions into that territory was always sought from Pakistan. And as such, the international atlases and maps showed it as a part of Pakistan. Would you like to comment on that, sir? Yes, obviously, that is uh, the case. And uh, the one instance that is very well known, and it is also uh, quoted by the Indians in a, in a negative manner, uh, is the U.S. Uh, uh, Geospatial uh, Intelligence Center. In their maps, uh, Siachen is uh, in fact shown as being under, uh, under the control or Pakistan having a kind of commanding uh, position over um, Siachen. Uh, so as far as international uh, recognition uh, of this position is concerned, uh, there has been, there has been no doubt. Of course, uh, the but Indians. All the atlases, uh, the uh, National Geographic, uh, the Absolutely. Britannica, the Time Magazine, all the University the of Chicago, and they all showed very clearly that this was under the control of Pakistan. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, then, when the Indians made the incursion, of course, uh, they they have tried to make a case, and they have been building up this case. Uh, initially, they accused Pakistan of what they called cartographic aggression, uh, that by showing Siachen in the maps, uh, which were basically available to um, provide it to the uh, mountaineers and the expeditions and all, uh, Pakistan was, uh, was making a cartographic aggression and asserting uh, its position. Um, Later on, of course, they beefed up their position by saying in the 90s, they were saying, uh, well, one uh, advantage of uh, keeping Pakistan engaged in Siachen is to punish them for their very low cost uh, activity in uh, Kashmir. Uh, more recently, we've seen the memoirs of the former um, raw chief, um, uh, Mr. Sood. Uh, who has said that actually the purpose was to deny, uh, to scuttle Pakistan's attempts uh, to, to gain access uh, to, to Tibet and Ladakh and also to provide China uh, with an but easy that route. That is preposterous. Why would Pakistan be interested in Ladakh? Well, this is exactly, I mean, you have to have some evidence of an interest. In fact, Pakistan had not in any way manifested uh, its position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Siachen. In fact, between 1962 and the mid-70s, 
uh, Pakistan had not even allowed or given permission to mountaineers. And most of the mountaineers who came, uh, particularly for Everest, they went to Nepal. However, in 1976, Pakistan allowed a British expedition, a very well-known mountaineer, and, uh, and subsequently set up a system uh, and provided Sherpas and other facilities to the mountaineers. Uh, other than that, Pakistan had not taken any step uh, to demonstrate its so-called ownership or commanding position. Or, or uh, even overseas. hegemonic designs. Absolutely. And coming back to the air marshal, now 13th of April 1984, India occupies it. And of course, Pakistan tried to wrest it back, but the Indians were at an advantageous position. And being a military man, you appreciate that the terrain plays a major role. And since then, we have had tremendous casualties, although in 2003, we have had the ceasefire. But it is the weather, the inclement weather, the terrible blizzards that claim more lives. And I believe over 5,000 lives have been lost, out of which the figure for Pakistan is less than 1,000. But for India, it is more than 4,000. Yes. Still, they persist. Why? To begin with, uh, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, say that <coughs> it wasn't really that Pakistan uh, went to, uh, to fight uh, and, and recaptured the area. It was they simply moved in late because the Indians took initiative and uh, they are the aggressors. They just decided to go occupy those heights. And in terms of time, when you move late, there was only that much left. Uh, you know, if, uh, if it was for the Indians, they would have, I think, taken the whole of it. So uh, if, uh, roughly speaking, it was about two-third with them and two-third, which is the heights. And like you said, that you enjoy a tactical position when you are at height. So they enjoy this position. And if you were now to fight, you are fighting from a position of a weakness, uh, from a position of disadvantage. So I don't think uh, that, uh, that any amount of fight will really get you back those heights. Uh, once again, you said that uh, India is uh, hell-bent upon uh, uh, retaining occupation of that place in spite of the fact that there's not only a huge loss of human life, uh, the, in, the expenditure they incur uh, <coughs> is horrendous. And, uh, and what are you really achieving? If one was to ask, uh, what are the benefits uh, that you get by, by you know, occupying and retaining that land, I would say nil. No, but the sad part is that the Indians are spending much more than us. They are losing many more lives than us. Uh, in fact, uh, you see, uh, we have a natural advantage because of the passes which you, you mentioned. And that was, of course, the yes. genesis of the whole thing, that we had natural incursions into it. So Indians have had to beef up their airfield at Thois. They have had to build a helicopter, uh, MI-17. They have made capable. many other staging posts. Staging they are well posts. organized there. But it, their daily cost runs in millions. Yes. And it is the Indian public which has been demanding that what is the purpose of this standoff? But yet, you see there are people like Jasjit Singh, Air Commodore Jasjit Singh, of formerly the head of yes. ITSA, yes. who said that what the ambassador was just saying, that Pakistan should be punished and cost-benefit analysis can come later. Yes. So this kind of... Uh, so this is purely being egoistic. In this case, uh, you know, like when I mentioned Nehru, you can understand uh, the approach of a politician. And uh, what I hear is that uh, politically, even today, uh, there is a school of thought that says that there's no point uh, really remaining there and, and bleeding your economy and uh, losing so many lives. Uh, it is inexplicable, but it is the military, it is the army particularly, I think uh, maybe uh, the only time that the army has, has come up and said that, look, uh, we achieved it with a great difficulty and somehow this is now being a matter of egoism. Uh, they just want to be there and, uh, and, and, and project that they are powerful and uh, the same mentality about Pakistan, uh, intransigence, high-headedness. I think these are the factors uh, that just force them to stay there. Right. Otherwise, there is no logical explanation. No, but if you permit, uh, Ambassador, if you recall in 1989 when Rajiv Gandhi was visiting Pakistan and Muhtarma Benazir Bhutto Shaheed was the Prime Minister, both young prime ministers, very outward looking, had nearly reached an agreement. In fact, all was to be done was that Rajiv Gandhi goes back to New Delhi and makes an announcement that the troops will withdraw. But 
what happened after that? It didn't come about. Well, the meeting of the young prime ministers was preceded by meetings of not so young uh, officials. And uh, as a result of those meetings in New Delhi and in Islamabad, there was uh, a broad understanding on the principle of withdrawal. Both sides agreed that they will withdraw. However, it is fair to, to add that the Indians, uh, even at that time, uh, not of course at the level of the Prime Minister, but at the level of officials, senior officials, uh, insisted on recording exactly where the troops were at the moment. And as we, uh, we were discussing, India occupies two-thirds of the In military glaciers. parlance or diplomatic parlance, authenticating the positions. Yes. And we had problems with that. We had problems with that because we said, first, it's legitimizing aggression uh, in a document. And second, uh, you could always say, look, uh, if I was at a particular position, then should this or that or that happen, I have a return to, I have a right to return to that. Uh, but I understand that Pakistan uh, is, uh, is uh, willing to consider uh, an appropriate way of recording uh, what happened. In, but in uh, 1999, if you recall, sir, and I believe you were there, it was also the election year. And some advisors of Rajiv Gandhi told him that the photographs of the Indian troops withdrawing from there will look bad for your election campaign. And that gave him cold feet. Absolutely. So there was a position from the politicians. Uh, but most of our Indian friends who have been coming here, we recently had Shashi Tharoor, uh, who Mani was a deputy minister, and Mani Shankaraya. They both, in their public uh, uh, statements or the occasions when they spoke to the people, uh, they conceded that the main problem was uh, the, the uh, insistence of the Indian Army uh, that this spectacular achievement by the Indian Army uh, should not be undone. But, and, uh, but formally, uh, I should mention that Siachin uh, is one of the eight topics which are in the basket uh, of issues uh, in the composite dialogue that was, uh, that was set up in 2003. And there have been, there have been uh, discussions, of course, uh, inconclusive. And uh, what we hope is that this Only on Siachin we have had 12 talks, and the 13th is uh, in the near future. Uh, uh, Marshal, this tragedy which struck on 7th of April, and it's a major human tragedy. But the thing is that if you uh, recall uh, Lieutenant General Chibber, who yes. was commanding the Northern Command from India and was responsible for Siachin, he's been quoted by Berek Bere in his article, Frozen War Between India and Pakistan in the New York Times. And he mentions, he quotes General Chibber, that we thought that we were there only for this summer. but. Later on, we had to continue there. We were not even prepared as far as apparel was concerned, as far as uh, mountain and gear was concerned. And that is why their losses continue to be extremely high. And now, <laughs> it is uh, pathetic that Lieutenant General Chibber has become one of the biggest proponents for peace and goes about talking about the futility of war. And there are peaceniks on our side also, who after this incident are talking about unilateral withdrawal from there. What, sir, is your opinion? This is very unfortunate. <clears throat> I think people uh, who do not have sufficient knowledge have just surfaced and are proposing solutions that are absolutely ridiculous. See, there is there is a cost for uh, for respect for your sovereignty uh, that you have to pay, and if you have to look at the at the attitude attitude of your adversary, starting from the Kashmir problem, look at all issues, uh, even on this if they thought that they were there temporarily and they were to go back uh, and they haven't, what does it show? That over a period of time, the, the, time, the, sta the stance is hardened. And uh, should you be doing this when the whole world is talking about, uh, and on the face of it, they also, uh, they also claim that they are for, uh, they're not for confrontation, they are for reconciliation. Uh, that is what the world wants uh, today. And in order to move forward, we are two neighbors, both uh, nuclear part, and is it, is it wise on our part to be engaged uh, in, in hot spots like this rather than reduce these 
uh, we are adding to these and then over a period of time uh, as we say uh, uh, there isn't much return out of this and yet it is pure intransigence uh, that is keeping them over there for us to say that there should be a unilateral withdrawal doesn't make no sense and uh, it has to be resolved uh, with dialogue and there must be a dialogue between the two sides their latest stance is even harder than before when they talk of authentication there is a cash to it and beyond th they have gone actually beyond authentication and now they are talking of delineation so behind this whole game is the attempt to get the loc regularized which remains disputable and not only that to extend it and uh, to occupy places uh, where they have been and to gain a favorable decision out of this which of course is absolutely contrary to the spirit of the united nations resolutions and the uh, thoughts and aspirations of the kashmiri people and we sir should never agree to a unilateral decision we have only been asking that kashmir should be resolved as per the resolutions and not as per our aspirations and that is what has not been accepted so there are un resolutions and on this also like i said that the first person to write in our favor about this glacier being part of our northern areas uh, was a un representative in pakistan and india so the whole thing started from there and that is where the line went northeast because right. they thought that this was legitimately under the control of pakistan okay sir for a closing comment what should be the way forward <coughs> there is no option uh, other than um, the two countries uh, negotiating um, the solution of the problems. There are eight uh, clusters of problems uh, which were identified in the composite um, dialogue. And I hope that this recent tragedy will uh, be a powerful message uh, to both countries but more uh, to the Indian government whose uh, stubbornness is mainly responsible for perpetuating this conflict uh, to activate the process uh, so that this uh, problem can be resolved and so that we can cut down on human losses, we can cut down on the colossal oh. environmental right, uh, losses that are inflicted by this conflict. So viewers, with that we come to the end of this discussion. The tragedy which has occurred on the avalanche of Siachen at the position of Gehari is tremendous. 135 lo lo lives lost in one go is not an infinitesimal figure. And we have to think about the families and the dependence of those people who have made this sacrifice. But the important thing is that there is no cost, no sacrifice which is less or small for your sovereignty, for peace. So let this be a lesson to people on both sides of the divide that we are fighting for a territory and it is the nature and inclement weather which is taking its toll. So the important thing is to withdraw, to demilitarize and find a solution on peaceful means. If that happens, then this particular sacrifice would not have been in vain. I would like to thank you, Air Marshal. Shahid Latif and Ambassador Shafkat Kakakhel for your very cogent comments and viewers keep watching us. Hope to see you next week inshallah. Allah Hafiz.